huge portrait of Mao Zedong broods in Peking's Tiananmen Square, where his people still pay homage at his mausoleum, though they have discarded most of his teaching, spurned many of his ideas. In his day, it would have been unthinkable that his people would rush for a glimpse of a British queen. Not that they were successful. At the last minute, the Politburo decreed that the Queen's arrival would be a closed affair, giving security as a somewhat spurious reason, and defying the Queen's wish that the people should see her and she should see the people. China hasn't changed that much. So it came about that only a few favoured party officials and a lot of press were permitted to witness this piece of history. The 77-year-old president, Li Shanyan, moved carefully to perform the ceremonial greeting. But the Queen had scored one point. She was in an ordinary limousine instead of the dark windows, closed curtains model that Chinese had offered. And the colour of her mohair coat was a compliment to her host's political persuasions. The meeting with President Li produced a handshake of record-breaking duration. Then, for the first time, a British sovereign stood to attention on Chinese soil for the Chinese national anthem. A goose-stepping guard commander sounded most aggressive. He was actually offering in the nicest possible way to show her his guard of honor. Quite a guard too, each man exactly the same height, a sort of recruiting by tape measure. At the end of the line, President Lee prepared to greet the party faithful. The Queen smiled, probably realising that even here, politicians never miss a chance of milking the limelight. Then the primary school children took over with a song whose refrain said, You're welcome, most warmly welcome, but sounded more fun than that. For the Queen, the children took the edge off the austere feeling of the ceremony. She began to relax a little, let the tensions ease. The march past of that all the same height guard of honor was a spectacularly disciplined affair. This may be one of the best that has ever paraded before her. Of course, for the ordinary people of Peking, the day had started hours earlier. They rise with the sun when they can see it through the city's heavy pollution, and when they rise, they exercise.
Even opera singers prefer a quiet park to practice in. The bicycle is still the nicest way of going to work and the most popular, though the western gift of traffic jams is literally just around the corner. Still, even that could be better than rush hour buses in China. It's the bike carts that bring the vegetables and fruit into the city every morning. Excellent produce and a good example of the newly permitted free enterprise allowed here these days. The farmer and the market people get to keep what they make on the produce. The result so far is that the quality is better. There's much more variety about, and that finds ready buyers because there's much more money about too. <laughs> Consumer goods are suddenly everywhere so that people can get what they call the big pieces. Television, radio, sewing machine, fridge. There are hairdressers attempting Western styles to the sound of 60s music. But when it comes to leisure, it's the older pleasures that survive, like kite flying, which for 2,000 years the Chinese have used as an expression of their freedom. On toddlers' outings to the zoo, they still use the wise old method whereby no one gets lost. And when a child waves, the panda winks back. But in Peking, where everyone works six days a week, the day off delight is boating. The Duke of Edinburgh, rather indiscreetly, said Peking was boring. Certainly it's a grey old place with uninspiring high-rise buildings made sooty by coal fire and industry and producing smog like London used to have. But at its heart lies a gem, the Forbidden City, the imperial palaces of the Ming Dynasty covering 250 acres of the centre of Peking. In the days of the emperors, it was an offence punishable by death to enter the gates. There was also an imperial law that no building in the city could be higher than the Taihedian, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. These days you can be an empress for five minutes to impress the neighbours, and your husband, when he takes his baseball cap off, can be an emperor. Quite an upmarket snap for a pound. For the real thing, known here in translation as the foreign female king, there was rather more protocol and an entourage that flowed behind her like a river in flood. On this tide, she was swept into the Hall of Supreme Harmony, a rare occasion for the old building since the People's Republic to have a monarch in its own throne room. It's an impressive place, though a bit chilling, and maybe there's still a whiff of autocracy in the air. It's also a little fraying at the edges, particularly the great dragon throne itself, which looks a bit like an old stage set abandoned by a touring company of Chu Chin Chow. That same interpreter, she of the limitless words, explained it all. Everyone dutifully looked, then craned their necks to take in the superb wooden ceiling. The ceilings are a feature of all the 9,999 buildings in the Forbidden City, nine being an auspicious number for the emperors of the Ming Dynasty. It takes about an hour to walk in a straight line through all the gates and halls of this ornate acreage. And like many a tourist before her, the Queen discovered it's not easy on the feet. but worth it to see things like the carved staircase which falls like a waterfall of stone from Great Hall to Courtyard.
In some ways, the little lanes of the city are more interesting than the showpieces, but they didn't show her much of those. Still, she did get to walk through the Emperor's garden, which is calm and quiet and not all that ornate. The authorities had allowed a few ordinary people to stand and stare politely, which pleased the Queen, though she was not to know how unusual that was to be on this trip. After an hour, the motorcade took her back towards the reality of Peking. The forbidden city, in its incomparable way, reverted to entertaining the tourists. That evening, in tiara, diamonds, rubies, the full fig, the Queen climbed the staircase of the Great Hall of the People. You could almost hear rumblings from the old chairman's mausoleum across the square. And once again, a British sovereign was making history. President Lee looked a little nonplussed at this unusual guest. But he'd gone to a lot of trouble with the banquet. Very pretty table decorations and place settings, which included knife and fork as well as chopsticks. There was an item on the menu called Buddha jumping over the wall. It turned out to mean sea slugs. The Chinese may be poetic about their menus, but their real concern is to eat as often and as much as possible. They're a nation of compulsive eaters. That's why the street stalls do a roaring trade throughout the day. A bowl of dim sum between meals keeps the pangs away. Everywhere there are food markets, and when they're not buying or eating, they're gazing at it. In the south, the Cantonese boast they will eat anything, including lizards. They buy live fish on a string. Small tortoises which provide little steaks. And I'm afraid, kittens. It has to be said the people of the north think the Cantonese are barbarians. Snakes have speciality restaurants all of their own and snakes include cobras. At the best places, they skin them at your table. You can get a snake platter with a dozen different recipes. And the ultimate delicacy is a glass of the bile. Just snip, pour and drink. Peking ducks start life like any other ducks, except that they're treated with much more kindness, pampered really, an idyllic life that lasts 40 days and 40 nights. Once dead, they're pumped full of air. The sugar syrup is generously ladled on and they're roasted over wood. They're carved and eaten with enormous solemnity. For the Chinese, food is the most serious thing in life. And you can't start too early. Now the political round must begin. The Queen met all the senior Chinese leaders and a lot of time was set aside for each meeting, duly photographed by both sides. The main meeting was with Mr. Deng Xiaoping, the ultimate leader of today's China. He's a veteran of many purges, a party survivor who took part in the long march which forged the revolution. Well, you know, I'm an old man. He's Mr. Deng doesn't even have a title, yet he's the undisputed boss. Now 82, he's the man responsible for China's new open door policy. And he likes a joke too. When I was in Paris, I was told that uh, when the weather was very fine, when you were standing on the uh, Eiffel, the, uh, that, the tower, 
you can see you can see uh, Britain, part of Britain. Is it true? London. <laughs> I don't think you would do. I think that would be rather difficult. It's quite a long way. I think that would be rather difficult. It's a major idea of Deng's is that the best education should be for those who will best benefit from it, like these children in a Peking kindergarten. They are deliberately chosen from the ranks of one-child families. Parents having only one child get tax concessions too, and the descendants of revolutionary pioneers. Pure elitism, in other words. Mind you, being elite can be a bit of a strain. Unlike the regimented welcome she was to experience later, these children had a degree of spontaneity. The children staged the song and dance show for the Queen. who arrived late from work elsewhere, was in time for the finale. children rather formally said may you and your family reign happily for many years not an entirely revolutionary sentiment and so to the unique experience a walk on the Great Wall of China The village of Baodeling, 50 miles north of Peking, is where the wall has been restored and made accessible. Even so, it's not for the faint-hearted. Neither are the souvenir shops whose owners have interpreted free enterprise as the open wallet policy. Very successful too. Tourists are everywhere, and the Chinese, suddenly with money and freedom, turn out to be naturals. <laughs> The Queen turned out to be another natural, making light of the climb. She walked three times as far as the planners had allowed for and wasn't at the least bit puffed at the end. Of course, the sensible shoes helped and a desire to make the most of the occasion despite having that absurdly overblown entourage in tow. This extraordinary bulwark has been here for over 2,000 years. It was built 200 years before the birth of Christ. It was the idea of the Emperor Qi Yin, the first emperor who unified China behind this barricade. Now it is the only man-made object that can be seen from outer space. So up past the awesome massed ranks of photographers she went, ever upwards, towards the high towers. Indeed she was game for two more towers yet. If she'd kept at it, she would arrive in Mongolia. 
If she'd turn left at the start, she could walk all the way to the Gobi Desert. The point about the wall is that it worked. It kept out the Hun and then the Mongol. Only now has it surrendered to the photographers. In fact, the Queen's Laika would have had more work to do had it not been for that interpreter again, embarking on one of her word marathons. She's clearly the sort of lady who swallows guidebooks for breakfast. It took 140 years for the Ming emperors to join up the wall to its full length. It was wide enough to take 10 infantrymen marching abreast or five horsemen. This section of Badaling is 25 feet high, a daunting prospect for your Hun or your Mongol. By now the Queen was almost at the end of her chosen distance. She looked over the ramparts. Even now it looks fairly hostile out there. This is what they used to call the land beyond the wall, enemy land. And so behind the wall, China was created. Then with an attendant fussing unnecessarily and distractingly, the Queen discovered the tourist truism. Coming down is harder than going up. She trod the old stones very warily using the hand drill. At the end, she was thoughtful, as most of us are, confronted by the grandeur, the scale, the beautiful defiance of the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Shanghai is like no other city in China an odd blend of Asia and Merseyside, with more sophistication than either, and a marvellous waterfront. That it ever became more than a fishing village on the Huangpo River is entirely due to British colonialism. In the mid-19th century, we imported opium from India despite the emperor's objections. When trade became difficult, we sent in the gunboats, and that's how we won concession land in Shanghai and the island of Hong Kong. Indeed, there's still a small whiff of the colonial atmosphere, overlaid with the excitement of a bright, clever people who believe they're the best in China and are not slow to tell you. Certainly the shops are the best in China, with luxury blatantly on display. Though they still use the abacus to tot up the bill, calculators or no calculators. This is now a boom town and enjoying every moment of it. At the airport, the children rehearse the performance they give for every visiting head of state. The band came willingly, except perhaps for just William here. At last, they were all in line, poised to begin the show, as the Queen's Tri-Star moved through the morning heat haze to the exact inch of its allotted position.
Today, thoughts of Britain's role in the colonial past were put aside, though that part of history is taught in the schools these welcoming children attend. The children, anyhow, were now into their well-drilled act. But not everyone was happy. The men of the PSB, the Public Security Bureau, were being thoroughly unpleasant to the British photographers. Mr. Michael Shea, the Queen's press secretary, intervened. They've not had one good picture yet. Come on, take it along as well. You must get a grip of this. There's these security people all over the place. The Queen, oblivious of this, was having her first ride in a Chinese red star limousine. Following up was the British Consul General's car, a London taxi. In the old city of Shanghai is the Wuxinting Tea House, said to serve the best brew in town, and reached by the bridge of nine zigzags. It does a roaring trade in the afternoons. The ground floor is the takeaway department. To reach the tea house, the Queen strolled through the old alleys. It seemed peaceful enough, or as peaceful as it can be with this sort of following. But that row with the PSB men was flaring again, this time involving our man from the embassy. He was trying to keep the photographer's line of sight clear. The Queen tried, not very successfully, to look in the shops. Fifty years ago, you would have had your throat cut in these alleys. Now there was more security than you could shake a stick at. Mr. Shea rightly got upset about this again. His intervention developed into a furious row involving a senior PSB man. The row continued round the corner as the Queen got closer and closer. She spotted what was going on and decided to leave well alone. At last the tea house was in sight, much to both sides' relief. The people of Shanghai struggled cheerfully against the rope and the police. But at least they got a wave as the Queen trod across the nine zigzags. She sat thoughtfully over her tea. Sir Geoffrey Howe decided he'd earned himself an indulgence of cakes. The trouble was that every time she took a sip, the waitress topped up the cup. There was a flourish of penny whistle Percy Granger.
And so ended afternoon tea. The Royal Yacht Britannia was lit from stem to stern as she lay at anchor in the Huangpo River. And the city answered her by illuminating its buildings along the waterfront. President Lee went on board for a banquet the Queen gave in his honour. Shanghai's elite trooped behind. Now, President Lee is not used to being ordered about, so the photo call produced something of a shock. First, his wife told him to put his glasses straight, and then... And smile. <laughs> As always on these occasions, the Queen took her guests on deck to watch Britannia's Royal Marine Band beat retreat on the quayside. The lights on the dock were put out, and on they marched. Now it was time to say goodbye to Shanghai. Near Xi'an in Shanxi province in central China lies the burial tomb of the Emperor Qin Shi Huang, the man who started the Great Wall. It's in this artificial hill and is sealed awaiting excavation. But people still go to climb it to pay their respects to the man who unified China and acknowledge a remarkable imagination. For beneath this hangar, a mile from the tomb, is the Emperor's gift to posterity, the masterpiece of the terracotta soldiers. To give the Queen a foretaste of the soldiers, they put live representations on the steps and set them swaying, a mesmerizing, eerie movement. The simple magic worked. The Queen was instantly entranced by these weird people.
but all that swaying is hard work, so afterwards it was off masks and have a rest, and a cigarette. But where did I put the matches in this rig out? The Queen was allowed down into the pit to walk among the terracotta men, a privilege not always accorded to visitors. The accident of two peasants digging a well on this spot revealed what is probably the greatest archaeological discovery of this century. That was in 1974. Suddenly a whole buried army, 2,000 years old, had come to light. There are 6,000 figures here, most of them almost as sound as when they were frozen in time. It was the Emperor Qi In's idea to have his tomb guarded by a complete pottery army. Each man is different in facial expression, different in moustache, in hairstyle. These are the infantry regiments on the march. Originally, the figures were multicolored, but an underground fire burned off the color. The Duke found a piece of charcoal from that fire so long ago. And dutifully, he put it back. There are, unbelievably, two more pits like this, thought to contain a further 2,000 soldiers. The excavation work will last well into the next century. The models for the faces were taken from real people all over China, including members of the Emperor's Guard. The bodies are hollow, the limbs and heads are solid, all individually sculpted. At the end, the Queen stood on the very edge of the pit in silence, looking down on the work still to do and the extraordinary scale of this ancient army, the terracotta soldiers. Around Kunming in Yunnan province, near the border with Burma and Vietnam, the land is rich and rewarding. This is the rural China the Queen had so little time to see. Of the two rice crops a year, this season's has been a very good one good enough for the women of the village to smile, resembling for a moment those stylized posters of happy communist workers achieving their norms. This is only a small village, but it has a mainish sort of road running through it, fortunately, as it turns out. The old lady hit on the idea of spreading low-grade rice on the road itself. The trucks roll over it, and she collects her harvest. It's really a brainy village. With an electric fan, it's easy to separate the grain from the chaff. Lake Dianxi, just outside Kunming, is one of the treasures of the city they call, when it's not actually pouring, the land of eternal spring and rising from the lake are the western hills, where on the highest ground there are some Buddhist temples. It's quite a trudge to see them. This is a diet. But it is worth it for the view. And for the mid-morning tea. <laughs> the point about these temples is that they are now being used for worship again under the new freedom for religion. The Cultural Revolution didn't stamp out religion, it simply went underground. Now the monks can pray again. They bang the temple bells and drums for the queen. She seemed fascinated by the statues. And they seemed ferociously interested in her. 
within this border province, there are 24 different national minorities, each with their own language and culture quite different from the Chinese. Here, for example, British teachers have Mongolian and Tibetan pupils in their English classes. The names of these nationalities at their own university here make a catalogue of strangeness. The E people, the Bai, the Hani, the Aini, the Zhuang, the Miao, the Wa, and the Chinpo. With all this ethnic culture around, there had to be a performance, started off by the Thai people. The Chinese had the good idea of giving the Queen lunch on an island on Lake Lianchi. A rather swish riverboat with potted palms at the bow set off decorously across the lake. What happened then was that the Queen and the Duke had the perfect opportunity to see those famous old Chinese paintings come to life. Canton's Children's Palace is the playground of China's gifted children. This is certainly elitism again and means the near guarantee of a special career. But when it comes to a performance for the Queen, it seems even more care has to be taken. And in China, makeup is an art in itself. But before the performance proper, a surprise spectacular, if militaristic, display on the children's boating lake. And a further surprise. In the art class, which was of a very high standard, there was a familiar portrait. Though done by a boy quite unfamiliar with the subject. Arriving for the performance, the children swarmed to the Queen. On this last day, something which hadn't been rehearsed. It was quickly back to discipline, though.
And that should have been an appropriate last word. But this is China, and before Britannia sailed, the Cantonese were in united agreement about the farewell. Let there be dragons. So a visit for the history books was over, the first to China by a reigning British sovereign. The first chance for the Chinese to set eyes on a constitutional monarch, a concept they find difficult to grasp. Perhaps both sides have learned something about each other. After all, this is what these visits are supposed to be about.